because I had to write that down so that I wouldn't forget. <laughs> and we can share this with folks after the call, but Hudson, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Laura, and, uh, and everyone for being with me today. Uh, I'm so excited. My name is Hudson Taylor. My pronouns are he, him. I am the founder and executive director of Athlete Ally, and I'm uh, really excited to share with you the work that I do, the story of how I came to be doing it, and hopefully uh, educate and inspire you all on how we can create a more welcoming uh, community in, in the world of golf. Um, a bit of background about me. So I was uh, a three-time All-American wrestler from the University of Maryland. Go Terps. Maybe some Terps in there. I don't know, I can't hear you through the computer, but I'm hoping. Uh, after Maryland, I became an assistant wrestling coach at Columbia University for a couple of years. Go Lions, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but the real reason why I'm talking to you today is I, I founded Athlete Ally now 10 years ago in an effort to help end homophobia and transphobia in sports. Um, over the last 10 years, I've had the opportunity to work with teams, leagues, and athletes on how we create a more welcoming environment. Um, I've personally visited now over 300 colleges and universities. Um, I work with every incoming NBA player for the past seven years. Uh, we've done a tremendous amount of front office training. So I'm very proud to have been a part of or helped lead a lot of these conversations throughout the sports industry. Um, but I think it's important to note that I wasn't always an ally. I wasn't always educated or passionate as I am today. Um, and so although I was an absolutely adorable child, you got me in my, my awesome reindeer hat, uh, there were lots of reasons why I wasn't more vocal sooner. And I wanna start by talking to you through some of my obstacles, because I think we all come to these conversations at varying points of interest, of knowledge and of comfort. And, um, and I think it's important to meet people where they're at. So for me, there were four big barriers, four big obstacles for me in this work. Uh, the first is actually this guy. Uh, this is a picture of my great, great, great grandfather. Now, for most of you, the life and legacy of your great, great, great grandparents probably doesn't impact you on a daily basis. But for me, this wasn't the case. I see his name is James Hudson Taylor. He was a very prominent Christian missionary. He actually uh, brought Christianity to China. Uh, my mom went to Lancaster Bible College. My sister just graduated from a Christian college. I spent most of my uh, athletic upbringing going to Fellowship of Christian Athlete camps. And so you know, faith was something that was really important uh, in my upbringing, but it was also a major obstacle for me in this work. Um, I was not raised with the most inclusive faith-based uh, interpretation of the Bible. And, and, you know, I don't know about you, but I want my parents to be proud of who I am and, and what I'm doing in life. And so, unfortunately, as a result of the faith of my family for a long time, I didn't think that I could both be an ally to the LGBTQ community and, um, sort of respect and uphold the, the faith tradition from which I came. Um, and so I, I wanna start by saying that because it's, uh, it's a major obstacle in this work that we don't often talk about, but um, you know, it, it certainly, well, that was the case for me at least. Uh, the second big obstacle was that I was a wrestler. Um, this might come as a surprise to y'all, but the, the, the locker room is not the most inclusive space. I know, I'm gonna let that sink in. Mine's blown. Um, you know, I, I started wrestling when I was five years old. It has been and continues to be the most important aspect of my identity. Um, it taught me the importance of hard work, how to overcome adversity. You know, I, I think I would not be who or where I am in life if it weren't for my sport, right? It opened every door for me. It made me my every friend. Um, it gave me unparalleled physical, social, and emotional growth. And I couldn't be more grateful for my athletic experience. But for all of the good that I learned from sport, there was also a lot that I needed to unlearn. You know, sport is a gendered space. It is a sex segregated space. From the moment that I started wrestling, it was boys over here and girls over there. And sport taught me that what was good was whatever was perceived to be masculine. And what was bad was whatever was perceived to be feminine. I was taught that if I wanted to diminish the efforts of one of my teammates, all that I needed to do was use a homophobic or a sexist slur, right? To question his sexual orientation. On the flip side, I was taught that if I wanted to diminish the efforts of a female athlete, 
All that I needed to use was a lesbian label or stereotype or to question her femininity in some way. And this really became the currency, right? This, is, this was a language that was, I think, used, uh, at least for me and in, in my athletic experience on every single team of which I was a part from when I was this big all the way up until I was competing at the most elite level. And so for me, that, that second big barrier is sports culture itself. <clears throat> Homophobia is a weapon of sexism. And unfortunately, in many of our sports spaces, that sexism is still being taught. It's still being um, sort of given and communicated to that next generation of athlete. Um, I have the opportunity through this work to visit, you know, athletes and teams at every level of sport. And whenever I do, I ask them two questions. How many of you in the last week have heard somebody say that's so gay? And still about 90% of the hands go up, regardless of where I am in the country, what level of athlete I'm talking to. Um, maybe it's not always coming from their peers, but there's a, a language that is still extremely commonplace. And then second, I ask, how many of you, when you heard that, heard someone speak out against it? And virtually every hand goes down. And so for me, that illustrates the point of how much work we have to, have to do. There's a culture where there's a language and behavior that's commonplace and at times accepted. And second, that there's not a culture where people are holding each other accountable. So that's, that's a, the second big barrier for me. The third is conformity. Uh, this is a picture of a guy named Solomon Ash. Uh, I don't know if any uh, social psychologist uh, background that he knows about the famous Ash experiment, but he did a really famous experiment where he got 10 people to come up on stage nine of whom were actually in on the experiment. So only one person was really being tested. And then he asked them a really simple question. He said, which line is the line on the left match? A, B, or C? After you look at it for a second, I hope the answer becomes fairly obvious. What are we thinking here? You can drop it in the chat. If you wanna feel, if you're feeling lucky, are you sure? Are you sure? Now, it absolutely is C. I know I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to trick you here, but um, <clears throat> what Mr. Ash wanted to do, he said, what would happen if I got the majority of people to intentionally choose the wrong answer? If I got everyone to say B, how would that influence the actual decision-making of that final participant? And what he found is he got, if he got everyone to say C or, or B, an answer that's clearly not right, that last person would also say B. And so for me, what that experiment uncovers is that we all have an innate desire to conform, to fit in, to be accepted and respected by our peers. And unfortunately, you know, the path of least resistance is often to say and do nothing. It's a lot easier for me to laugh at a homophobic joke than it is for me to call it out. There's a saying, uh, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. And I think in a lot of sports spaces, I, for one, at least was really afraid that if I stood up and spoke out and try to challenge the language and behavior of my peers, that it would put a target on my back, that I would suffer some negative consequences from being that outspoken person. Um, you know, sport is a competitive reward structure. We are not, we are taught not to just uh, measure ourselves against our opponents on our field of play, but also against our teammates, the people who we train with and live with and, and compete with on a daily basis. Who's varsity, who's junior varsity, who's a captain and who's not. And so unfortunately, I think that the third big obstacle at the moment is still conformity, that, there, that it's, it's okay to do nothing. It's okay to not act. Um, but I think the good news is, is that we can change that. We change sports culture. We can make it, um, we can make conformity err on the side of action. Um, so today it's an obstacle. For me, it was an obstacle, but I hope through these conversations and this work, we can start to maybe change that relationship a little bit. The fourth and final obstacle for me was awareness. And I want to see how all of you uh, do with this now. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? I mean, know the count. The answer is 13. Did you get that? You get 13? But did you see the moonwalking bear? Wait, what? 
Uh, so I don't know how many of you missed the moonwalking bear the first go round. I hope it was some of you. I don't know how many of you seen that video before. I hope it wasn't too many of you I think at this point most people have. Um, you know, it's a funny video, but it, it actually makes a really important point. And it's this, it's, it's easy to miss something you're not looking for. It's easy to miss something you're not looking for. The athletic experience is an insular one. From the time I was six years old to this day, I spent all of my time surrounded by other athletes, whether we were traveling, training, running, lifting, going to class, not going to class. I was with my teammates. And because of the culture of sport, because of that uh, lack of awareness, because of the desire to conform, for most of my life, I didn't think I knew anyone who was gay. I didn't have any openly LGBTQ members of my athletic community. There was nobody in my immediate social circle who was out. And so as a result, when I heard that language, I thought, why should I speak out against it if I don't personally know anybody who's impacted by it? And I think we all fail that awareness test in one form or fashion. You know, there's this, this disconnect between the intent of our language and behavior and the impact of that language and behavior. We fail to realize how what we say and what we do expands and resonates and impacts the people in our lives in unforeseen ways. Um, and so I think a, a, our, one of our big challenges is how do we create that awareness? Uh, you know, privilege is blind to those who have it. And I never want, once thought about how my language and behavior could negatively be contributing to the people in my life, to the people around me. Um, so I failed that awareness test for probably the first 18 years of my life. Um, fortunately, that that's, did start to change when I got to college. Um, I, you know, I, I started at the University of Maryland uh, as a theater major. So I was in two very different cultures, one where I had a lot of LGBTQ friends in the theater department who were coming out and being treated with dignity and respect. And the other where I had teammates using homophobic and sexist language on a daily basis. And one of my first ahas in this work was um, my freshman year, first semester, there was a kid named Matt who sat to my right every day, five minutes before class started, he stood up, took a deep breath and said, class, uh, I have an announcement, I'm gay. And there I was not sure of what to say or how to react or what to do. And the room got really quiet and all kind of looked around. And then there was this one person in the back of the classroom who had that perfect timing, <clears throat> you know, like, the time to, kind of timing you want to have your, your whole life, like you always want to be that person, <laughs> but you never are, you know what I'm talking about? They, they saw their opportunity and they stood up. And they started the slow clap. And I was like, first off, I was so upset it wasn't me because I was really wanted to be that person. No, dang it. But uh, next thing I know, the entire class is standing and clapping and giving Matt high fives and hugs. And I'm witnessing this moment where Matt, the kid to my right, is taking a really personal yet public step to being truer to himself. And he's not only welcomed, but he's embraced. You know, he's treated equally, respectfully, without judgment. And it was honestly a really beautiful thing to see. And then I started to think, if that had happened on my wrestling team, in our locker room, would we have started the slow clap? I mean, I'd like to think that we would have, but then to go back across campus that afternoon, to go back with my teammates and hear that same tired language really put this into perspective for me, made me take a step back and say, well, wait a second, there's a culture and a conduct here that is less than what it should be, right? This is less than what it should be for the sport of wrestling, for my team, for sports in general. You know, the fact that only 24% of LGBTQ youth participate in sports, the fact that those that do drop out of sport at twice the rate of their heterosexual and cisgender counterparts, or that 80% of athletes are not out to their coaches or teammates, that is a choice, right? And what I just saw in the theater department and this like embrace and the support and what he experienced without judgment, like the fact that we don't have that in sports, that's on us, right? That's on us to change and to do something about. 
And so it was because of Matt that for the first time in my life, I could see that moonwalking bear. You know, I kind of had that aha moment of like, wow, maybe the things I say matters and maybe just maybe I can be better. I can do more. Um, and I should say it wasn't an overnight thing for me to be doing this work and dedicating the last 10 years of my life to, to Athlete Ally. Um, it was a, a slow, steady pro process, but there was definitely one major catalyst for me, which if it weren't for this, I wouldn't be talking to you today. So I slowly started to get better educated and I was taking a lot of philosophy and women's studies and queer theory classes and really unpacking my own relationship to these issues in sport through the classes that I was taking in college. And I got to this point in my athletic career where my senior year, I was ranked number one, number two in the country at my weight class. And I was training to win a national title. And I realized that my ability to affect change was in part tied to my time as an athlete. That the second that I, re that I stopped competing, my platform is diminished just a little bit. People will, will care what I have to say just a little bit less, right? So I decided to use my opportunity to, to try to make a difference. So I actually um, started my senior season by wearing this LGBTQ equality sticker on my headgear. Um, if, again, if it weren't for the sticker, I would not be here today. I had no intention of making this my life's work. I was going to become a wrestling coach. I was going to train for the Olympics. I was going to have that very traditional like athlete path. Um, but this changed everything for me. And a couple things happened. First, it started a lot of difficult dialogue with my teammates. We got in a lot of heated debates. Second, one of my coaches pulled me aside after practice and said, you know, Hudson, would you, um, would you be doing, will, willing to do an interview about why you care, you know, about why you're an ally? Yeah, I said, sure, of course, no problem. I didn't know it at the time, but that coach of mine uh, was actually closeted. You know, he was actually not in a place personally or professionally where he felt comfortable interjecting into those conversations. Um, but then the third thing that happened was I did that interview. And one of the things that's most important to me in this work is that progress doesn't occur unless we're willing to engage, unless we're willing to have a difficult dialogue about any issue. So being the uh, naive, idealistic college kid that I was, um, I asked them to share my email address with the article wasn't ready for the response. Um, <laughs> about two days after that article posted, I opened up my inbox and I had over 2000 emails from closeted athletes from across the country who wrote to me and said, you know, Hudson, I just read this article and uh, I'm gonna try out for my, my wrestling team. I'm gonna go into the locker room and not be afraid. I'm gonna start standing up and supporting my gay brother, my lesbian sister, my transgender friends. And I got to be honest, I was reading those emails just bawling because, you know, for me, my athletic experience has, it's always been assumed to be a positive one. I've never had to question or fear how my teammates might treat me if they found out something about me. I've never had to bear that burden of homophobia and transphobia in any real or personal way. And, you know, email after email after email just made it so clear to me that Every single day on our middle schools and our high schools on our college campuses, there's an entire population of people that's being systematically excluded from having the same experience that I had, from having that same relationship with sport, that same love of sport. And that, again, is a, is a tragedy. And it, it genuinely makes me really sad that that's the state of things. Um, but it got me thinking, you know, if I could get 2,000 emails as a wrestler, imagine if I had been a football player or a team or a league or a professional golfer, you know, an entire sport governing body doing their part. That impact would be exponentially greater. And so out of that experience, I decided to start Athlete Ally. I started the organization with a really simple philosophy in mind. That there's never been a successful social justice movement for minority group without the support of the majority. That if we're serious about ending any form of oppression or discrimination, it can't just be the responsibility of those who are impacted by it, who shoulder the responsibility of ending it. We all have to work together arm in arm to make our athletic communities everything we know they can and should be. I'm proud to say that, you know, in the last 10 years, we've seen more athletes come out, more allies speak out, 
more teams and leagues take a stand than in any other time in our nation's history, right? A lot of good, good things are happening, but uh, this is not the beginning of the end, right? This is the end of the beginning. We are at the tip of this work, right? We are at the very beginning of this work in so many sports spaces. The fact that there aren't more out athletes at the highest level of these sports should be an indicator to everybody that we have a lot more intentional, proactive work to do to make sport a place where everybody is accepted and respected. So I wanna spend the rest of my time with you talking about how we do that, uh, how we do that at Athlete Ally, how I think you can do that within the world of golf. Um, and, and then I'm gonna open it up for questions at the end for anybody who has them. So as I go through this, if things come to mind for you, um, please drop them in the chat. Uh, you know, we're, we're gonna definitely circle back and, and get them all at the end. So as I kind of mentioned before, when I think about the, the sort of structure of, of the problem, uh, there are really three pieces to this that I think perpetuate homophobia and transphobia in sport. I talked about the structure of sport and how I think that uh, in part causes some of these issues. That structure helps inform the culture. That culture helps reinforce, is reinforced by the policies. And you have this cycle that is cyclical and intergenerational. And, and I think it's why um, the pace of progress has not been the same in sports as it has been in other sectors. Now, with that said, I think there's a, a really easy blueprint for how we break the cycle. And it's this, I think there are three pillars to what I'm asking anybody and everybody to do. Number one, we have to figure out how do we build safety. Number two, we have to figure out how we share vulnerability. Number three, we have to figure out how we align on purpose. What do I mean by this? Build safety. Every athlete with whom you work needs to know that you have their back, that they are supported, that they are loved, that you are there with their best interests in mind. There are policies and practices and things we can say and signals we can be sending to build that safety. But right now and today, the assumption is that sport is not a welcoming place for the LGBTQ community. So if we want to build safety, we have to disprove that assumption. So we're gonna talk about the ways to build that safety through our policies, through our practices, but big pillar, how do we make every athlete feel safe, feel supported, feel like you're there for them? Number two, share vulnerability. You're gonna make a mistake. You're not gonna be perfect and it's okay. We have to own that. We have to be transparent about that. Um, be able to uh, take criticism, give criticism, uh, you know, apologize when mistakes are made. If we pretend like we have all the answers all the time, that's going to come off as really disingenuous. So we have to create a culture that's also um, has vulnerability at its center, where it's okay to say, hey, I screwed up. Hey, I need to be better. Hey, I'm trying to figure this out. Um, that again, builds trust. A lot of this is just how do we build trust? Um, and then the third piece is align on purpose. So as an athlete, you know, it was always really clear what our athletic goals were, but I think we also need culture goals, right? We need to, you need to make it really clear what your core values are as a coach, as a leader. What are, what do you want the experience of the athletes you serve to look like? And how are you communicating that to your constituents? So align on purpose is sort of that forward looking North star. What is the ultimate experience that we want to make golf your game, right? How do we do that for, for every single young person who, who picks up a club for the first time? And how do we make sure that the values that we state and define are actually explicitly connected to people who hold a minority or multiple minority identity? If we have a core value, but we're also not saying sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, we're not using the right, we're not using the words, then we're not breaking that assumption. Because the, again, the assumption today is that sport is not a welcoming space. So we have to break that assumption. Okay, how do we do this? What does this look like? Basic, 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 uh, four things to start. One, we have to learn the terminology, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, you have to get really comfortable and able to say LGBT, LGBTQ. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with coaches and they LQPG, they just, they don't, they can't even say the acronym convincingly and, and uh, confidently, right? At the, at the very basics, right? Learn the terminology, 
and be able to say them comfortably. Go ahead, look in a mirror, practice it a couple of times. LGBT, LGBTQ. If you if you stumble over over those basic of or over the basic terms and acronym, then that closeted athlete that you're working with is going to hear that. That's going to be a signal to them that you're not fully educated. You're not fully doing your homework, your work to make their, their experience as positive as possible. So learn the terminology. Number two, we have to say the words. So if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? I think it's similar to creating an inclusive culture. If you attend this training, you learn the terminology, but then you don't actually use it, then it might as well never have existed. So we actually have to say the words. I think beginning a season, beginning your first interaction, those are great times to set the norms and expectations around non-discrimination, around accepting everybody, and then saying the words LGBT, LGBTQ, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression. Number three, with the challenge assumptions. So people are gonna misstep. How do we make sure that we are catching it and addressing it when it occurs. Um, we're gonna talk about this in a minute, but I think there's lots of ways in which we can build better muscles to challenge assumptions and, and sort of bad conduct when it occurs, but it's like a broken window, right? That, that broken window is a signal that we can behave in a particular way. So anytime somebody uses non-inclusive language or behavior, we have to have a response that we feel comfortable and consistent putting in action. And then number four, is know your resources. You do not need to be an expert on this. There are lots of organizations and individuals out there who are a resource to you, myself included. If somebody comes to you with a question that you're not sure the answer of, that's again, it's a great opportunity to practice that vulnerability. Hey, that's a really good question. I'm not sure exactly what the right answer is, but I'm gonna go find out for you. So knowing who to call, knowing who to reach out to when something arises um, is equally important, right? Pretending like you know the right the right recommendation for uh, you know somebody who holds a minority or multiple minority identity can actually do harm. So you just got to be really thoughtful about knowing your resources. Okay. Uh, some policies. These are just basic things to think about. Um, I'm not going to go like too too deep in the weeds on any of this, but I just um, I think it's important for me. Um, it's important for us. So number one, create core values. So it, this has to be made really explicit. I think from the outset, if I could go to every athlete with whom you work and ask them, Hey, what are the core values of this program? If we could get every athlete to say the exact same thing, that is the perfect foundation off which to create an inclusive environment. Right. So create those core values. You know, I believe that respect and accountability are two really good values that we can connect back to the experience of LGBTQ athletes and how we're either fall, how we're falling short uh, of living those core values. But that's piece one. Piece two, uh, adopt LGBTQ inclusive codes of conduct. So non-discrimination policies, fan codes of conduct, trans inclusion policies. If the LGBTQ community is not explicitly included in the policies governing your sport or your team or your relationship with athletes, then again, it might as well not exist. Um, so create those codes of conduct. Athlete Ally, we have lots of guides and resources on what they are, what they can look like. Um, but basically, you know, that, that closeted athlete should be able to see themselves in the policies that are meant to support them. Number three, communications, uh, the media, media guide, community outreach, camp brochures. So um, basically, you know, in all of the relationships that you touch on social media, how are you communicating out your values and expectations? Um, if there is, you know, June is Pride Month, what actually is being shared out during Pride Month about creating an inclusive environment for LGBTQ athletes. Um, how you communicate can be intentionally inclusive or not. It's easy to, to sort of pick your path. Number four, uh, accessible resources. So this is something we work with a lot of athletic institutions on. Um, basically, if you have a policy, but it lives in, if it just lives in a handbook at the bottom of a drawer, it's not good enough. So when you look at your website, 
and the ways in which a, uh, an athlete or employee or any member of your team before they come to you You, but um, oh, we're we're in, we're back. Uh, uh, I don't know how much you do or don't um, speak to to dress codes, but it's something that we've seen in certain athletic communities. Um, too gendered of a of a requirement uh, could be a form of exclusion for somebody who presents in a more in a less binary or more fluid way. Be consistent. Uh, so it's great. Okay, we have the, we've done the we've done the homework. We know the terminology. We say the words. We have the policies. They're accessible. They're inclusive. But if if it's a one and done, then we're also missing missing our opportunity here. So how do we articulate? We have to articulate those values and policies consistently. Uh, I usually look at this as you know beginning of the year, beginning of practices. Uh, there are lots of ways in which you can you can build a routine of making those values and policies known on a recurring basis. Um, number two, show commitment passively or uh, non-verbally. So you know I'm wearing an athlete ally T-shirt. There's pride pins and lapels and wristbands and shoes. There are lots of ways in which you can be sending signals to the LGBTQ people in your life that you support them and have their back. Um, I know not everybody is equally comfortable engaging in a conversation. So getting comfortable, just again, signaling that you, you see and you hear and you support your LGBTQ athletes um, is really, really important. Number three, define the line. So again, when something non-inclusive happens, how are we calling it out? How are we correcting it? Um, I personally think that if you have a core value, that's one of the easiest tools that you can use to correct bad behavior. So when I was coaching, you know, one of our values was like, respect all, fear none. Um, so if ever somebody said something homophobic, I just say, hey, respect all, fear none. Like that, that's, not, that's not what we're about, right? Ultimately, this is not about why, uh, what, what somebody should not be doing, but it's about who are we as a people? Who are we as a team and an athletic community? So those core values, I think, are a really helpful tool in correcting bad behavior when it occurs. Um, number four, annualize your commitment. Again, this is just like, what is the what are the dates in the calendar year where you know that you can consistently come back to this conversation? Right? Having that, that annualized commitment um, is a great muscle to build for sort of starting to change your, your culture. Number five, uh, use your virtual voice. So, uh, you know, what you're sharing out on social media, um, right now you can see my Zoom link. I have my pronouns listed, um, right? So telling people your pronouns through the SIG block of your email, through your Zoom, your Zoom um, the articles and things that you share online. Those are all ways in which you can use your virtual voice to let it be known to, to the LGBTQ people in your network Again, that you're, that you're an ally, that you support them. And then finally, uh, use organic opportunities. So every single day, there are things happening in the world that are a great talking point, good things and bad things. Athlete comes out, athlete does something bad. Let's talk about it. How do we feel about that? How would, how would we respond if that happened on our team? Right? Those are great learning opportunities without having like a, a speech. You know, I, I think sometimes as a coach, I'm like, listen, I, I have so only so much time in a day and so much time with my athletes. I want to focus on the, the X's and O's of making them better. Um, but those organic opportunities are great learning, learning opportunities for us. So think about those organic opportunities that you can bake into your conversation over a meal, driving out to a, to a competition. Um, lots of ways to, to integrate that. Great. Um, 
I have 10 other things that I wanted to run through, but I'm also mindful of our time. So again, I'm just going to say, um, uh, please, if you haven't asked questions, drop them in. I'll, I'll, I'll go through these, these 10 next like little things um, just to have it recorded and have it for your use uh, later, but I'll, I'll do it really briefly so that we have time for questions and, um, and all that. Basically what I wanted to just share in the next 10 slides is understanding that not everybody is equally comfortable showing up in all the same ways and that's okay, but everybody can do something. Right. And so my job is to help you figure out what are those things that you feel like you can commit to tomorrow or today. And if everybody can find the one thing that they can say, yeah, I can do that differently. I can do that better then that's success. Um, number one, we talk about this with athletes all the time, detect, reflect, reject. So if at a bare minimum, we could eliminate homophobic language, that would be a huge win for us throughout all of sport. We do this by detecting biased language and thoughts when it's about to occur, reflecting on why we did it, and then ultimately rejecting or choosing not to behave or speak in that way. Number two, uh, learn the history. So there are so many books and podcasts and audiobooks to, for you to get better educated about the history of the LGBTQ rights movement, both outside and within sports. Um, but we are only as effective as we are knowledgeable. So learn the history of the communities you're seeking to support. Doing so will make you a better advocate. Step back. Um, so, you know, privilege is something that gives people unearned advantages, right? It, it's going to get more doors are, are going to open for some people than for others. So when you recognize your, your privilege, privilege and the advantages that you might have, um, use that wisely, right? Speak less, listen more. Um, I get asked to sit on panels all the time. It, those are opportunities for me to ask or demand that there's really diverse representation on that panel so that we're actually hearing from diverse voices whenever and wherever we can. So know when to step back. That's a powerful form of allyship. Number four, uh, diversify your social media. Who you like and follow, uh, will change the content that you're exposed to. There are so many LGBTQ organizations, you can follow Athlete Ally, you know, add us to your newsfeed so you can get just little doses of this information on a daily or weekly basis. That'll help you be better educated and better connected to uh, those communities you're seeking to serve. Wear your beliefs. Uh, we talked about this before, but that's sort of no passive or nonverbal ways in which you can be showing up, again, Wearing your beliefs might not matter to your heterosexual or cisgender, uh, the people in your life, but to those folks who are LGBTQ identified, that, that could make a big difference, right? It could be the reason why they, they stay in the sport of golf, why they choose to come out to you, why they perform better athletically, or uh, they just have a better overall experience. So wear your beliefs. Number six, uh, point to the passer. When we're working on joint group projects, um, people aren't celebrated for their contributions equally. Um, easy way to just help uh, sort of the rising tide lift all boats is to be really intentional about celebrating everybody who contributes to making something successful. Um, number seven, word consciousness. So this is really how we start using gender neutral language. Instead of assuming that everyone you're talking to is heterosexual or cisgender, um, ask others if they have a partner, spouse, or significant other, instead of saying husband or wife. Um, when you don't know someone's pronouns, you can use their first name or you can ask them their pronouns. You can also start, it's a good practice to say, hey, my name is Hudson, my pronouns are he, him. How about you? Um, so those are good, good sort of ways in which we can use, be more conscious in our language. Um, and again, don't, don't make that assumption that everybody you're, you're working with is heterosexual. I think I, I've also seen this come up in the sporting space um, from the perspective of parents. Don't assume that the parents of all the athletes with whom you work are opposite sex, right? You're going to have LGBTQ parents uh, for the young people you're working with. Um, it's important to just keep that in mind. Comfortable call-ins. Um, I know not everybody's, uh, this is probably like the hardest part of like, okay, how do I actually engage when somebody does misstep? What do I actually say in the moment? Uh, I know for me, I get a lot of anxiety about that tension and that conflict. 
Um, so I would say, number one, commit to a threshold statement, which is, hey, can I talk to you about something later? Right. So we're not going to have the, the sort of direct conflict or intervention in the moment, but we're going to commit to addressing it at a later date. That'll give you time to step back and think about what you wanna say, how you wanna say it, maybe remove yourselves a minute from, uh, from, from the moment in which somebody said or did something. And then when you do have that conversation, really we wanna align on two things. Why you feel what they said or did was wrong or problematic or, or not values aligned. And then two, what you hope they would do differently next time. So the why and the what, if we can align on those two things, hopefully um, people will, it'll resonate. Number nine, I said this before, this is about vulnerability. Own, or own your ignorance. If and when we make a mistake, acknowledge and embrace it. It's okay, it's okay to mess up so long as we're honest about it and we're, we're, we're having these conversations from a good faith perspective. And then lastly, uh, I said this before, but I'll say it again, know your resources. It's okay if you don't have, know, have all the answers, know who to turn to. Uh, organizations, individuals, either within your organization or outside of it. Um, action without education can cause unintended harm. Uh, we see this a lot if, um, if an athlete comes out to a coach, that coach then maybe tells people who they shouldn't, or they give advice to that young person in ways that they shouldn't, that could actually do real harm for, for them. Um, because that knowledge is uh, it's really dangerous if, if it's not handled with extreme care. So knowing who to seek out when something is uh, brought, to, brought up to you that you may not know how to deal with is really, really important. Those are all the things. I'm just going to close out on my side with uh, a quote and a metaphor uh, that inspires me every single day. And then I'm going to open it up for questions if you have them. Uh, it's one of my favorite quotes in the whole world is by uh, Cesar Chavez. He said, once social change begins, it cannot be reversed. You cannot uneducate the person who has learned to read cannot humiliate the person who feels pride. You cannot oppress the people who are not afraid anymore. He goes on to say, I have seen the future and the future is ours. Now, when I started this work, uh, I didn't know what it meant to fight for social change. I didn't know what it meant to be an ally or an advocate. So I asked a friend who had been doing this for some 40 plus years. I said, what does it look like to fight for social change? And he said, Hudson, I want you to imagine yourself uh, standing at the edge of a cliff. I want you to all do this now. You're, you're standing at the edge of a cliff. The bottom of that cliff is the ocean and beyond that is the sunrise. Now, when we stand up and speak out and fight for the things we believe in, we take a step closer towards that edge. We get a little bit uh, scared, a little bit unsure as to what people might say, how they might respond. But the truth is, is that when you're fighting to make the world a better place for the people in it, we go towards the fear, right? We stand on that edge. That's the place for those who are fighting for social change. And when we're in this place, I can promise you all two things. The first is that from this place, there can be nobody who stands in front of you. And the second is that it then becomes your responsibility to describe that sunrise to everybody who stands behind you. And that sunrise is the possible, it's the future. It's whatever we want our, sport, our sporting communities to look like. Um, and what I know and fundamentally believe is that if everybody on this call here today chooses to, to step up, to go towards the fear, to stand on that edge, um, before long, that sunrise is going to be a reality. So I want to thank everybody for your time, your attention, for having me share a little bit of my work and, and story with you. And I just want to encourage everybody, um, go towards the fear. Thanks so much. Thank you, Hudson. That was amazing. I, I know I took a ton of notes and I was definitely taken aback by the stats where you started with the um, 24% of youth participated, only 24% participated in sports, right? And what was the dropout rate? You said 80? It's just twice the rate. So if, you know, when we look at the dropout rates, like a significant number of kids drop out of sport by 16. Um, so LGBTQ youth are dropping out, you know, much sooner, much faster than their heterosexual counterparts. Okay. No, thank you for, for sharing. We really don't have any questions, but there were two comments. Um, we have more coming in, but uh, Kyle Wynn uh, said, even as an openly gay uh, golf professional slash coach, I too have had to learn the terminology. 
uh, because it's newer, right? Like the pronouns and the ways to converse with other LGBTQ friends and family to make sure I'm being inclusive. But thanks for sharing, Kyle. And Devin Fox from the PGA Tour said, great point, Kyle. I work at the PGA Tour and I'm also a member of the LGBTQ plus community. I have to uh, learn to be an ally to my trans friends, family, and coworkers as well. Always uh, learning new and different terminology as concepts. So thanks for sharing. Um, and then Jen, I see you have a question, so feel free to, to go for it. Well, thanks, LD. Um, yeah, I totally agree, Laura. This is amazing. I, I took a ton of notes too. Um, really enjoyed your inspiring work. Uh, my question, I live and work in Florida, as a lot of the folks on this call do. And the, um, the legislation that was just passed here, the, I think called the Parental Rights in Education, known as the Don't Say Gay bill was passed. And I just wondered how that's affecting the work that you're doing and um, it, just any thoughts you have on it, because I've been getting into some spirited debates with friends about it and I, I just want to be super informed. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I'll say, you know, one of our challenges right now is that this, despite all the progress, this political environment, we're seeing more anti-LGBTQ legislation introduced and passed across the country than in any other time. So literally, this is the most anti-LGBTQ legislative session in our nation's history. And, you know, Florida is just one, one piece of that overall puzzle. Um, you know, there's a restriction on trans athlete participation at the youth level, access to health care. Uh, you know, you mentioned the parental rights and, and sort of not, not talking about LGBTQ issues. Um, it's, it's really challenging. I mean, for Athlete Ally, it doesn't it totally impact our work because so much of our work is at the collegiate and professional level of sport is where we are showing up the most. Um, my understanding of the Florida bill is what first through third grade or kindergarten through third grade is its application. That's but nice. the challenge is, you know, where do you draw that line as to what, you know, if somebody's openly LGBTQ and their, their spouse comes and, you know, picks them up from school, like, is that a violation of a law? You know, there's, there's real silencing and erasure of people's lived experience through, through these laws. And so that's, I think, really, really difficult and problematic. Um, in general, I mean, how we how we deal with it, I think is if, if we say what we're for instead of what we're against, we can hopefully work through it. Um, you know, I, I think there are ways of talking about our values and norms and expectations that hopefully can um, subvert or sort of get around some of those those laws. But um, but yeah, it is challenging. And ultimately, you know, if in any state where where we lack where there's a, like more of a political balance, right? If any, if there, if there's, if there's no political power, then these laws are going to get passed. They're going to get introduced and they're going to get passed. And there's nothing that we can necessarily do about it. So then, the question is, what is our response? And how do we, how do we show up? How do we talk about it? How do we not talk about it? Um, so I, I don't necessarily know the right answer, but um, you know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't know if that's. Uh... No, it's helpful. You're pro there isn't the right answer right now, and it, it does. Uh, I'm, I was surprised to hear you say this is the time in history when it's been the most against LGBTQ plus rights in legislation. That's unbelievable. So, the last just the last need to keep Yeah. So we have one more question, Hudson, um, from Tom Lawrence. He says, our organization has had, has had much discussion analyzing our gender classification to be much more inclusive than just male and female. Can you guide us to resources um, that would help us be more inclusive for all? Sure. Um, so I think that there's probably two pieces to this conversation. One is um, sort of with, within a competitive framework and then outside of it. Um, so at Athlete Ally, we do a lot of work on how we can support uh, sport governing bodies, teams and leagues on supporting sort of like the social transition of athletes. Um, you know, we institutions will work, you know, have trans athletes, they have non-binary athletes. So um, I think there's a lot of work that can be done on 
sort of forms and applications and, and you know, making sure that you're making it as easy as possible for someone to, um, to designate their, their pronouns or create, you know, when somebody applies or shows up, uh, a lot of times they get funneled into a male or a female category that can um, be exclusive, exclusionary for somebody who is non-binary. So I would think about, you know, f uh, a good like process to, to consider is if I was a non-binary person trying to register for something that you're putting on, how do I do that? And how do I do that in a way that doesn't deny my, who I am, right? So look at, I, I would do an audit of, of all those forms, all those ways in which people are, are showing up. I think um, when it comes to the actual sort of rule set and classification, that's a much bigger question. I think there are many ways in which we can rewrite and redefine rules. Um, we could be based on you know, performance averages rather than gender or sex. Um, there's probably ways in which we could we can create more mixed play, uh, more you know pairing of people together. Um, but I think a good first step is in creating non-binary pathways for people to register and show up from day one. And then phase part two is then what do, what does the actual participation experience look like for those individuals? Uh, that makes sense. Yes, thank you so much. And so looks like we have two more questions um, from Rosemary. Um, so first one, what is the most significant thing you'd like to see from sports governing bodies? Um, so I would like to see two very specific things from sport governing bodies. One, I think we have to create a better uh, benchmarking of coach education when it comes to not only LGBTQ issues, but so many, um, so many issues impacting the young folks that we're seeking to serve. My coaches were like father figures to me, but they were the least educated when it came to equipping, you know, helping support the full diversity of, of their athletes. And so I think it's uh, first is like getting really you know, making it mandatory to, to meet a really intentional baseline of education around cultural competency of which LGBTQ education is a part. If we could just get that, that done, I think that some of those statistics I shared about early access and retention for LGBTQ youth hopefully will start to change, right? So we need the people in positions of power oftentimes have the least education on some of these issues, we need that to be reversed. We need them to have the most education. Um, so that, that's piece one. Piece two, and this is more of a, like, not political thing, but like, you know, there, I mentioned this legislative session and all these bad bills that are getting passed that are doing real harm to the LGBTQ community. I think that, the role of sport, sport governing bodies in where you do business and how you do business in the states that are passing these laws is a really important question to be asking, right? And it's not only on LGBTQ rights, but like if, if on the one hand, you, we feel and we believe that our constituents hold the following identities, and then on the other hand, we are doing business within the, the spaces that is doing harm to those folks, what is our responsibility to them? What is our culpability in that? Um, and so like for Athlete Ally, one of the things, one of my, um, my director of policy and programs right now is in Zurich meeting with FIFA about the Qatar World Cup, right? So here's a country that, ha that lacks many LGBTQ protections. What is the responsibility of FIFA in, in protecting and upholding the rights of LGBTQ fans and players in Qatar for the duration of the World Cup? Um, so we're asking that same question of sport governing bodies here in the U.S. Um, Athlete Ally, we've been a part of the, the 2026 World Cup uh, bidding process. So there are lots of cities that are bidding for World Cup play. And we hope to see human rights uh, embedded into the decision making of where those events go. So, um, and then I, I think beyond that, I would just say like, think about how you can better be tracking the prop, tracking the experiences of the people whom you, you're working with, being transparent about what you find, creating measurable 
uh, specific goals to, to help overcome them. I think that, you know, so much progress moves at the speed of trust. And we only can build that trust when we are transparent and consistent and, and actually collect, you know, asking the right questions from the right people and doing something with the answers that we get back. So I'd also just think about for all of you, what does that process look like to be really intentional about taking stock and where we're at so we can better know where we're going? Well, thank you, Hudson, super important from what you just shared. And then one more, um, we have somebody on audio who also would like to ask a question from the 561 phone number. Well, feel free to send. If, you, if you wanna uh, email me after, I'm also happy to, to follow up with anybody um, later today or tomorrow. Laura, Laura. Oh. there you go. <laughs> Laura, my apologies. I forgot to do the star six. I just hit my mute button. <laughs> This is Sandy Cross at the PJ of America. Hudson, thanks so much for this education. I think it's excellent and it was super informative and highly actionable. My question is around inclusive pronouns. Is there a distinct difference between using two pronouns versus three? For example, you'll see people use he, him, his, and then you'll see other people use he, him. Um, is it just a preference for brevity or is there a difference between those two approaches? Just a preference for brevity. Yep. Okay. Yep. Either one is great and awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Great. Well, um, just a lot of thank you action on the chat, Hudson. And, and thank you so much for everybody who took their um, Masters Thursday Tiger uh, playing lunch break to be with us. <laughs> it is very appreciated. We had uh, close to 100 at one point. So this is awesome. Um, I'm going to send the recording out to everybody that registers. So feel free to forward it along. And I'll also share Hudson's contact for anybody that would like to follow up. So have a great rest of the week, everybody. Thank you. Excellent job, Hudson. <laughs>